We can illustrate the GNN filter using a 1D example that is similar to the 1D examples that we have looked at before. We have two objects with scalar states. PD is equal to 0.85, the clutter intensity is 0.3 from minus 5 to 5, and the likelihood is Gaussian with variance 0.2. We have a random walk motion model with variance 0.25, the initial priors have mean minus 2.5 and 2.5 and variances 0.36. And to visualize the results, we will consider the marginal densities and estimated expected values. If we simulate these models, we can get the sequence of detections shown here. So this is what we have to process with the GNN filter in order to compute posterior densities and object estimates. If we simulate these models, we can for example get the sequences of detections shown here. So this is what we will process with a GNN filter in order to compute posterior densities and object estimates. We start with an initial prior at time zero. The first object is on the left in blue, and the second object is on the right in orange. First we predict to time one, and at time one we get a set of detections. In this case, there are six detections. We compute an optimal association which is illustrated here by coloring the associated detection with the corresponding object color. So on the left, we have a blue detection associated to the first object whose density is blue, and similarly on the right with the orange detection. And lastly, we use the optimal association to update the object densities at time one. Next, we predict to time two, we get a set of detections. This time we have five detections. We compute an optimal assignment, and we use it to update the object densities. So that's how the GNN recursion goes. We predict, we compute an optimal assignment, and we update. In this figure, we have visualized the GNN posterior densities as heat maps. So for each discrete time step, higher color intensity corresponds to where more probability density is located. And where it is white, neither object has any significant probability density. The unassociated measurements are shown as white circles, and the associated ones as colored squares. And we see that for both objects, in most time steps, a detection has been associated, but there are also some time steps with uh, no associated detection. Here, we've illustrated the measurements and the posterior densities together with estimates and ground truth. So on top left, we have the measurements. On the top right is the posterior densities that we just had a look at. In the bottom left, we have illustrated the posterior densities together with estimates shown as black circles. So the black lines show how the sequence of estimates for each object evolves. And lastly, in the bottom right, we have a comparison of the object estimates and the ground truth. Due to the measurement noise and the process noise, the estimates are not perfect, but they tend to follow the ground truth reasonably well. In this slide, we show the same type of figures, but for a lower probability of detection. Before it was uh, 0.85 and here it is 0.5. So in order to make the comparison as easy as possible for us, we have the exact same underlying ground truth for the object. We have the same clutter detections and the same measurement noise for the object detections. So what is different is only the simulated detection process. Now we have more misdetections. Some interesting differences can be seen. Because we have several time steps in a row where a detection is not associated, the visualization of the marginal posterior densities are more smeared out. And that is because the covariances are much larger when we predict and then do not have any associated detection to update with. But due to the fact that we have more misdetections, the estimates can be seen to be worse than previously, which is most evident for the first object colored in blue. From time one to time seven, this object state is estimated to be smaller than what the ground truth is. In fact, this result is an illustration of a general property of GNN filters, which is that they can perform worse when the signal to noise ratio is lower. So low SNR is, for example, when PD is low, or the clutter intensity is very high, or the measurement noise covariance is large. So the fact that GNN performs worse for low SNR is related to how the exact posterior density is approximated. We can have a look at the posterior density approximation for an example with two objects. Two measurements equal to minus 1.6 and 1 and a Gaussian prior. And you might recognize that we have used this example previously to illustrate the measurement likelihood and the posterior density.
So here, the exact marginal posterior is shown together with a GNN approximation for three different values for the probability of detection. And we also show the posterior weights for the different data associations. When PD is 0.95, which is shown on the right, one of the data association hypotheses has a posterior probability that is almost 0.8, which is quite a bit larger than the probabilities of the other associations. And therefore, approximating the posterior using the most probable association hypothesis gives us a reasonable approximation of the exact posterior. For object 1, shown in blue, there is actually very little approximation error. When PD is a bit lower, 0.85, which is shown in the middle, the most probable hypothesis is the same as for PD equal to 0.95. However, the probability of this hypothesis is no longer much larger than the second largest one. And subsequently, there is a larger difference between the exact posterior and the GNN approximation. And lastly, when PD is even lower, 0.5 shown on the left, we have a similar situation. The most probable hypothesis is that both objects are misdetected, and this has probability just over 0.4. So when we prune the remaining weights, the remaining hypotheses, that corresponds to almost 60% of the probability of the hypothesis. So we get a clear difference between the exact posterior and the GNN approximation. We can summarize GNN with some pros and cons. Positive is that GNN filters are computationally cheap tracking algorithms and are relatively simple to implement. There is also empirical evidence that show that GNN filters work fairly well when the signal-to-noise ratio, or SNR, is high. So in other words, when PD is high, the clutter intensity lambda is low, and the measurement noise covariance is small. When it comes to the disadvantages of GNN filters, we have that it is actually not guaranteed that by greedily taking the optimal assignment in each time step, we will get the data association sequence that is most probable. It can be that, at time k, another sequence of data associations is actually more probable than the greedy sequence. So this is related to the fact that a single n-object hypothesis is not always sufficient to represent the uncertainty of the tracking scenario. The GNN filter can give poor tracking performance when the SNR is moderate to low, or when the SNR is high, but the objects are close together. In such cases, multiple data association hypotheses will have high probability, and by pruning all of them except for a single one, we get a poor approximation of the posterior density.